think there's an announcement I need to make. Oh, very practical one. We are not dismissing our kids to their classes today. So uh, if you as a parent get a little fidgety, <laughs> that's all right. We're okay with a little extra noise. Uh, it might even get a little warm in here. But this is a, a family time for all of us to be a part of what will take place in the next moments. Uh, we're going to have a baptism service. That's why there's a tank of water up here on the stage. It is heated, in case you're wondering. And six will be baptized today. So we're not going to dismiss. We're not going to have our stand up and greeting and welcome time. We'll do that at lunch. And so uh, I just want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, <clears throat> excuse me, to Romans chapter six. And I want to explain for just a few moments what it is that we're doing here. Why is there water on the stage? Why are people going to be immersed underwater? What is this ceremony? If you've never seen baptism in a church before, I want you to know what's going on here. Baptism is a celebration. It is a proclamation. It is public testimony. Baptism is not magical or mystical. Baptism doesn't accomplish something before God for a sinner. Baptism does not make a sinner right before God. Baptism does not transform a life. Baptism is a public testimonial, a public profession of an inward reality that has already taken place. That God has forgiven sin and that a life has been transformed. What forgives sin is faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. New birth that produces repentance and belief. A turning from an old way of life and a turning to Christ. A turning to, from other things to worship and turning to worship the one true God. A, a turning from sin and self and slavery to freedom and life in God through Christ. And Jake has already described for us how this forgiveness can take place. That God himself came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and lived on the earth. And he lived as a man so that he could die as a man. Subject himself to death in the place of sinners who believe. You see, the only way a sinner can be made right before a holy God and God maintain his own reputation of goodness and justice is if sins get punished. But the only way the sins get punished and the sinner not suffer forever under the wrath of God is if a substitute goes in between. That's why Jesus came. To endure in himself the infinite wrath of God while our sins were transferred to him so that he could transfer his perfect righteousness to us so that we the sinner could stand before God justified declared in a heavenly courtroom as never having done anything wrong and as always doing everything right. And you who are in Christ, you know the staggering nature of this grace. You know your sin. You've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And you know his beauty and his holiness. And the closer you get to Christ, the more awe-inspiring he is. And the more sinful we realize ourselves to have been. And the thought that my sins would be transferred to Christ so that he would be punished for me. So that his righteousness could be transferred to me. And I treat it as if I had always done everything right. Is too good to be true. It, it, it's the kind of grace that humbles. It's the kind of grace that transforms. We don't. Walk around with a clean slate, just whew, glad I'm not getting caught for that. Go on with our lives. <laughs> this is a radical forgiveness that transforms the sinner from the inside out. This is the reality that Paul displays for us in Romans chapter 6. If you're looking down there, I want you to see verse 1. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died with reference to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? 
We have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be ruined so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. You see what happens, a a union with Christ through faith produces a union with his death. An immersion into Christ and a resurrection into new life as a Christian. That is what this water symbolizes. To go down into the water is an emblem of death and burial, union with Christ. And to come out of the water is a testimony. I have been raised to new life. My life has been transformed. I am with Christ in his death and am now living with him in my life. That is what these will give testimony to. These six will not tell you how great they are. In fact, you'll get a pretty dark picture of despair, darkness, hope, slavery, sin, apart from Christ. And they're here not to boast in themselves, but to boast in Jesus and what he has done for them. And all of you who are in Christ, you you are already thinking back to those days in your own life when you recognized you were a sinner. You were the problem before a holy God. And God in his mercy opened your eyes to see his grace and his love and your heart was melted and your eyes were opened. And as you think about your own life and your own testimony, as these are courageously sharing theirs, we all feel together the affinity of what it means to have been forgiven and to be brought together as a family. In a very real sense, this is a living room. And this family is rejoicing in what God has done in these lives. And we just can't wait to hear. I want to turn your attention to the book of Acts for just a moment. In Acts chapter 8, we have the story of a man from Ethiopia riding in a chariot. And a man ready to preach the gospel named Philip. And the man riding in the chariot has a very expensive scroll of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And he's reading it and he doesn't understand. And and God in his sovereignty has placed Philip right there to overhear what he's saying. And and Philip says, "Do, do you understand what you're reading? It's Isaiah 53. It's the passage Jake just led us to through 1 Peter. That Christ suffered in the place of sinners. This was the Old Testament prediction of Christ's death, 700 years before Christ. And just after Christ died, this Ethiopian man is is reading this prophecy. And it has just been fulfilled and, and he doesn't understand it. And Philip is invited up into the chariot with him and explains Jesus from Isaiah 53 to the man. And they must have had a significant conversation about many things. We read in verse 35 of Acts 8, Philip opened his mouth beginning from this scripture. He preached Jesus to him. And then we get verse 36. They went along the road and they came to some water. (laughs) We don't get the whole conversation. But Philip apparently explained belief, repentance, faith, baptism. And the Ethiopian man says, hey, there's a puddle. Pull the chariot over. Can we get in? (laughs) And what's striking here is belief, repentance, faith, hearing the gospel, all of that happens, and water baptism on the same day. My heart loves that, and I wish we could get back to that sometimes, don't you? Somebody believes, and they get baptized. There are some reasons in our day why there's a little bit of space between that. Sometimes in a Christian culture, you can't tell if somebody has really believed or if they're just sort of interested or if it's phony uh, or if they've just succumbed to sort of Christian culture around them. Sometimes it takes trials, testing, sort of a demonstration of faith. But what I love about baptism services like today is, is you will hear some testimonies of people that are newly in Christ and some testimonies of people who have been in Christ for some time. And the breadth of articulation of what God has done. Same message. 
Jesus saves sinners and remarkably different stories. And I hope as you're listening, and and if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, I hope that you listen well. Because you're seeing people who have not done something to clean themselves up, but who've experienced the radical transformational power of God's love through Jesus Christ. I'm going to say one more thing and then we'll invite them up to tell their testimonies. The first one who will be baptized today is a few months shy of 16 years old. That's pretty young. Some of you might say, man, that's old. That's an old guy. I want to talk to you a little bit about youth and baptism. A young man and baptism. A young man who's still under his parents' authority, still in the home. It can be difficult to discern genuine faith sometimes. In a home where mom and dad love the gospel, preach the gospel, read the Bible, it's normal. In a church where the gospel is proclaimed, the word of God is taught, student ministries is happening, and and there's this peer pressure to be Christian. Sometimes it's hard to tell if, if a little one in your home really wants to please mommy and dad. Sometimes that, that desire isn't tested until trials come along, sometimes until someone leaves the home. But there are ways, there are opportunities at times to have windows into the genuineness of faith. I want you to understand that we take baptism seriously. We, we believe that baptism is not a thing by itself. Uh, This is a public profession of, I am in Christ, I've died, and I have a transformed life. It's a serious, sober proclamation. That proclamation comes with an affiliation. Because your uniting yourself publicly with Christ is also a uniting yourself publicly with the body of Christ, or the church, or Jesus' people. You're saying, I'm with them, because I'm with him in death to myself and a new life. And that public proclamation and public affiliation comes also with a public accountability. To, to stand before everyone and say, I'm in Christ and I am with these people is also at some level to invite the scrutiny or the accountability of that profession over time. And you need to know that someone who comes forward and says, I want to be baptized, I I want to profess my faith in Christ, and I want to align myself with you, believers, also means I want you to hold me accountable to that profession. If there are blind spots in my life, if I start to wander away from truth, will you please hold on to me? Will you help keep me? This is one of God's means for keeping his own. It's also one of God's means for helping the church maintain a pure testimony rather than hypocrisy. So with that being said, you're going you're to hear some of that in Christian's own testimony. You need to know some of the behind the scenes that mom and dad and Christian want this public accountability to a public affiliation and a public proclamation. This is sobering. Serious, joyful, all at the same time. So I'm going to invite Christian up. Christian Walker, would you come up and tell us what God has done in your life? Good morning. My name is Christian Walker. I'm 15 years old, and for those 15 years, I've been attending GBC. I'm here for the purpose of sharing my testimony, having been saved from myself and from the wrath of God through Christ. When I was five years old, I began to question what we were taught. I was terrified of hell, and there was no doubt in my mind about its existence. But I did doubt the validity of the scriptures. I remember asking my parents how we knew this religion was the right one. I got two answers. One was that the gospel was not a works-based salvation like every other religion was and the other was that the Bible was grounded in in historical fact. These answers did not persuade me, but I had nowhere else to turn, so I subscribed to the Orthodox Christian ideology. That was until I was six. There (laughs) There was an NGM session 
where we were in Exodus, and we were discussing the Ten Commandments. We learned that once the law was broken, it was broken. There was no repairing it. The only way to fulfill the broken law was through Christ's death on the cross. But I struggled with that. I knew the gospel, but I also knew God was holy. I didn't think any holy God could forgive the quantity of sins I had committed. And so I did not view the gospel as an option for me. I got home and I asked my mom how to unbreak the law, and I got the same answer. So I went up to my bedroom and I tried to figure it all out. I figured that works could not work because I had to repair the law and I could not do that. Um, I figured that I committed too many sins and so God, Christ's death on the cross was not enough to forgive me. So I thought that there must have been a third method of salvation, something no one had ever come up with or throughout history some, something that no one had ever come up with. This did not lead anywhere. I was terrified. I even considered atheism for a bit, but I soon put that to death because I knew Romans 1 was true, although I did not know that passage at that time. I was lost and I, I was a very anxious kid, so I was very overwhelmed by anxiety. One summer it got so bad that I couldn't eat much of anything, and in two weeks my mom had told me that I had lost a lot of weight that I should not have been losing. I turned to my mom for comfort, and my mom's intention was to destroy my anxiety, so it was never coddled. All the while, my view of God was distorted, and it turned from how could a holy God forgive the quantity of my sins to what God was so cruel that he dangles salvation in front of us for us to think that we have a great treasure. This train of thought continued until it spiraled down into depression, suicidal thought, the world is better off without me, etc. This led to extremely self-centered behavior. I was awful to my siblings and I hated them thoroughly. I would never have told my parents that because I, would, I did not want to get into that conflict. But if anyone else would have asked, I would have told them without hesitation. There was no reason behind this hatred. It was irrational. At this point, I was about 12. I had said something unnecessary about my little sister. So my mom responded by telling me that I was terrible. I was extremely prideful, so that stung. I asked why she said that of me, and she, re and she revealed my actions to me. So my mom had me unravel my thought process and explain, just explain what I had been thinking. And from there, she showed me the deception that was my depression, just as she had done with my anxiety before it. I learned in that moment that I was living for myself. That needed to change. I was then able to think of my brother without radiating with hatred. It was at that point that I was willing to accept Christ's death on the cross for my sins as the means by which I could live for him and not myself. I've, I've, seen, him, I've seen his gospel work in me through a willingness to love now, a lack of anxiety, contentment in circumstances I hadn't been before. Therefore, in obedience, I'm here to be baptized as a testament to God's grace in my life in giving me the capacity to love and repent from living for self. This is also a plea that all of you who call yourselves believers hold me accountable. I need to pursue holiness, and although I'll never truly be able to destroy my sin, my sins must not be allowed to exist. Thank you. Christian, based on your testimony and profession of faith, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Where is Jay? Okay, I see you. Take your time. Jay had uh, knee surgery just leading up to this service, so. Stand. 
This is either going to be amazing athletic endeavor. Well, it is. Okay, good job. I could have helped you. Oh, this is scary. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Jay. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this Baptism Sunday here. Um, I started coming to GBC about almost three years. Um, around that time, I was still looking for a home church, and I truly found myself appreciating this church. And here I am finally choosing to be a member and to finally be baptized after holding it off for almost a year. <laughs> but before I proceed, I would like to share my testimony and how I came to know Jesus Christ. I was born in the Philippines with a Catholic background. Um, my father was the only one raising me along with my older brother and sister due to my mother passing away uh, when I was two years old. So my dad was usually very busy on working and providing while for the most part, I grew up a very willfully and rebellious child. And it has got me in a lot of trouble. Um, raised as a Catholic, I've been told that we have to earn favor of, from God by doing works. While continuing to repress or inhibit bad, inhibit bad behavior due to the fear of punishment. And these bad behaviors will gradually come out worse and worse to the point where I either harm others or harm myself. Um, while, I while I continuously try to bury them with good works and priding myself for every self-improvement that I have achieved. And it made me confident in myself and my self-deceit on my standing with God. While I continue to blame the devil for every bad behavior because that's the best thing I could do at that time. My family moved in the U.S. in 2003 because my dad remarried. Um, living in the U.S., still have that willful, rebellious spirit, has gotten me into like a lot of bad influence and vices and partying. And during those times, I made a friend through those partying days. A friend from a friend from my girlfriend at that time, and he decided to be a Christian himself, and invited my girlfriend. And it, and it sparked an interest within me as well that maybe I should be more serious in my faith. So I also joined their Bible studies and got involved with them. And that's the start of the journey on getting to know Christ. At that time, I was accustomed to hopping from church to church hearing a lot about prosperity gospels, and they were very, very, like music to my ears, and it stroked my ego a lot. But that changed when I finally opened the Bible and read it for myself. As I read the stories in the Bible and how God loves his people and delivered them from their hardships through the antagonists of the stories. I found myself resonating on the antagonists in the Bible, the characters in the Bible. Like reading the story of the Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar. I find myself resonating on them a lot. That maybe I am not really what I think I am. Maybe not in deeds but the tendencies of my heart are more antagonistic than I could think. And my sense of confidence in my standing of God has been shook when he was truly starting to show the sinfulness of, of my heart by constantly repressing them. And I knew at that time that I needed a solution for my heart issue. And I knew that was Christ that I needed to repent of my sins and obey Christ and allowing his love and his sacrifice on the cross to be able to change my heart. 
and I held on to the hope that God would renew my heart and change my mind. Um, though that God has changed my spirit slowly, I was only still carrying the fraction of understanding the fullness of the gospel. And I was still chasing the works that I need to do to earn that. Um, there was a time I was walking in Mill Avenue in the evening doing uh, street photography and met two people evangelizing in the street. I remember them asking me if I know, the, know about the Bible and I answered I was a self-claimed Christian. And they started to ask me more questions and invited me to visit their church. We exchanged numbers and went on our separate ways, but I didn't pay, I didn't pay too mind on it. But like fast forward about a year later, I was able to meet those people again at the same spot. And he asked me if I finally able to join a church. And I mentioned that I wasn't at that time. And ultimately the conversation ended that he wanted me to invite me to his home to study the Bible together. And at, and for me, it was strange to actually see someone like a stranger that I met just twice within a span of two years to just invite me at their home and to be a part of his family and to have dinner together and just him sharing the word to me. It, it was different. And as he continued to share the word to me, something that really struck in my heart and the passages about that really changed my salvation or the thought of my salvation at that time and God's truth unraveled that I could never earn my salvation, that all sin, that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. None is righteous, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside and together they have become worthless. No one does good and not even one. And aside together they have become worthless, no one does good and not even one. And understanding that is as if another layer of my sinfulness had laid bare the, the more I understand my true condition in front of a holy God, the more I start to understand my sinfulness, the more little I really am, and God is really further than I thought, that I deserve his wrath more. And at that time, my understanding of the gospel have made a full circle, that God is truly a holy, and there's nothing I can do to earn my way through him, but through his love, through Christ so I may be saved in faith. And um, God has changed me since then. That journey of trying to get to know Christ for many years it was slow, but understanding the full of the gospel within my journey was sanctifying to see God's grace and mercy through my life as I continued to follow him and he humbled my heart. All my vices seemed to be at first inordinate and slowly and gradually become not a need for my life. All I wanted to do was to grow my faith and to start to want to be a part of a body. And now here I am deciding to be a part of a church body and to declare my faith in the eyes of the world, and not only to the world, but to every other believer that would, I could be used for, and they could be holding me accountable for m my life as a Christian. And I can't wait to see what God would reveal moving forward. saran wrap we may have to baptize your knee later because it's not going to get wet <laughs> okay 
All right, Jay, based on your testimony, profession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well done. I guess we're going out this way. Doug Heffel, would you come boast in your Savior for us? The few of you that I've talked to this morning and asked you to pray for me, now's the time. My wife, Karen, of almost 50 years, is always reading novels. And she always reads the last pages first, which I've never understood. So this morning, you're going to hear the last page of my story first. A few months ago, on December 4th, I became a member of this church, Grace Bible Church. The first thing I do every morning with my telephone, before I look at all the other junk on my telephone, is I have a Bible app and I read a scripture. This morning, the verse was John 16, 24. Until until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be made full. Oh, Father, I love you so very much. I ask in your name that your will be done in my life. Help me to be the Christian man that I need to be, because I so desperately need to have joy in my life. Amen. I was raised in a Southern Baptist church, went to Sunday school and church every week, vacation Bible school in the summer. I was baptized at 14 years old. I knew that I was saved. I knew that I knew and understand the gospel, believe the gospel. And also being a good Southern Baptist, I knew that I was probably still going to hell. When I moved from home, I stopped going to church. My entire life, I feel like I've been on a spiritual roller coaster with very high highs and very extremely low lows. But for most of it, I've not lived like a Christian. And then about 10 years ago, I met Tom Schrader and John MacArthur and started going to church again out at East Valley Bible. That lasted a few years, and then things began to change. I don't know if the church changed or I changed or it was a mutual thing, but I just couldn't be there anymore. And then for the next five, six years, I was basically a living room Christian. Sat in my living room, listened to at least a thousand John MacArthur sermons, had my Bible, had my John MacArthur um, study Bible, and that was fine with the family just as long as I kept all that crazy in the living room. But I knew I I needed to find a church. I desperately needed to find um, 
a church family and get back into church because I knew just sitting in the living room and being a living room Christian wasn't cutting it. And then just a little over a year ago, the Lord knowing what I was desperately searching for, but at that moment in time, what I des- I needed to find, and I came into a building with nice, decent, beautiful bathroom tile. I was next door. <laughs> at a reasonable price. <laughs> and then on January 22nd, just shortly after that, of 2022, I came into this building for the first time. <laughs> it sat right back over there in the corner in the stroller section. Looking around and realizing where I was. Going, oh, well, this, this is great being back here with all the whiny kids. And then I look up front and see all that would have got three, four guitars and drums at. Oh, this is perfect. We're going to hear a Christian music concert. But I wasn't going to give up my spot by the exit because that was the closest one at the door. And I knew this was probably just like all the other places I tried and I'd be able to blast out of here. And then they started the worship music. And it was real worship music. And then, oh my goodness, we're we're singing the Psalms. And then it came to the Lord's table. And just like Jacob just did a wonderful job this morning, the Last Supper was rightly and, and correctly explained. And this is the first time I've had the Lord's table in over five years. And at that point, I realized I was sitting in the perfect spot because I'm crying louder than anybody else in my row. <laughs> Tears run down the face. The stroller kids are looking at me like, isn't somebody <laughs> supposed to get him out of here? <laughs> and then the sermon started. And whoever was given the sermon just was dressed in a suit and a tie. And I, I just really respected that. It just... It just showed, I think, a respect and a sincerity for expositing the word of the God. And I said, I'm not going to wear a tie. I mean, maybe if the guy up front sitting in a casket, you know, that might be a possibility. <laughs> and then about halfway through the sermon, I heard whoever it was refer to John MacArthur. And I think I said out loud, I'm home. You can tell I'm a 1900 guy with (laughs) the, uh, the legal pad thing here. This is what I believe. I'm an eternally living spirit currently residing in a mortal, physical, human body. Of no fault of my own, I was born a sinful person, totally separated from my Creator, a holy, righteous, and perfect God, unable and unwilling to stand before Him and behold His glory. Then my God, the one and only true God, in the form of God the Father, Jesus Christ, Son and Savior, and the Holy Spirit, who is the will and power of God, adopted me, along with countless others, into his family. An adoption process that required Jesus to leave his heavenly throne at the right hand of God and be born of a virgin. He was still God, but now his glory was covered with the flesh and blood of a man. Page two is in here somewhere. Jesus then lived a perfect, sinless life 
and laid down his life on a cross as a substitution for the death that I deserved. Having conquered sin and death, three days later, he rose from his grave. During the next 40 days, he appeared to hundreds of people on several different occasions. Then he ascended back to the right hand of the Father and sent the Holy Spirit to indwell all of those that would believe and put their hope and faith in him. Lastly, Jesus will return to the earth and establish his kingdom that will be without end. Thank you. Doug, based on your profession of faith and testimony, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Rudy Ruan, would you come tell us what God has done in your life? So this has been a long time coming. Um, I've been wanting to be baptized for quite some time. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Rudy Ruan, and I'm being baptized today to make a public proclamation of the work God has done in my life. My life began as a young boy with a rebellious heart towards his parents and all types of authority. Like many of you, I'd grown up in a home that believed in a God, but not the God of the Bible. I grew up in a Catholic home where the occasional Sunday service was part of our family routine. We participated in traditional Catholic rituals such as Ash Wednesday and Lent. Although I was raised as a Catholic, I had a whole lot of hidden sins in my heart. In my youth, I had common sins of lying, stealing, uh, and many idols of the heart. In my teen years, I became lustful and would waste most of my time gaming and browsing internet content that I had no business looking at. I met a young woman in high school, which is where most of my hardship started. By now, I was able to add yet another sin to my growing list, fornication. This cycle of sin continued until my now wife was saved in her mid-20s. At this point, we had two sons. One was two years old, and the other was just six months old. My girlfriend at the time was being preached the gospel oh, <laughs> and had, in the moment, pleaded with God to forgive her. Uh, for all of the sins that she had committed. I remember coming home to an empty home. Both her and my two boys nowhere to be found in an empty home. I was confused on what I could possibly have done to deserve this. I had been a faithful, loving boyfriend who put his family first. To the world, I was a shining example of how a moral man should care for his family. The next 48 hours were full of anger and confusion. I spent many hours over the phone trying to get an explanation out of my girlfriend on how she could do something like this to me. She, of course, explained that we had been living a life full of sin and that was displeasing to her God. This made me angrier. And I continued to list all the things that I had done up and that I had given up or done to help support her since we were teenagers. Sometime later, she had invited me to a church she was attending. I, of course, accepted as I was eager to reconcile my relationship and get my family back home. I attended that church for over six months and continued to listen to the word be preached every Sunday. I was able to meet many sound believers who poured truth into my life. I had many nights, I had many nights wrestling with my own conscience on what the cost would look like to profess and to believe in Jesus Christ. There were many personal sins that I just was not willing to give up. One night, as if the light switch was turned on, I remember driving home from work and bursting into tears in the realization that it was my sins in which Jesus died on the cross for. The weight, 
The weight of my sinful decisions in life began to take hold as all I could do was cry tears of joy and thank Christ for what he had done. From that moment, I saved up what little money I had and I grabbed my credit card and purchased a ring to marry my girlfriend. The next week, we met with an elder at the church to discuss where I stood before the Lord. I must have passed the test because I was told that not only could I marry my girlfriend, but that he would be our ordained minister. After the ceremony, my now wife moved back into our home along with our two boys. I was sure that things would continue up from here, Boy was, but, what, but I was wrong. It wasn't more than a few months until I started going back into my old sins. Anger and bitterness were very much present in our relationship. As we continued to attend church and home life, I was constantly reminded of the offense I felt when I, she initially left the home with my two boys. I quickly became the victim of my own mind and selfishly lashed out at her for what she had done. I had reminded her of her past offenses toward me through our relationship. I would continue to lash out by name calling and using unkind words. As a result, we began to suffer in our marriage as we both knew that we were in trouble without some counsel or intervention. I would reach out to a brother in the church and seek counsel on what I was feeling. He quickly reminded me that forgiving someone means not bringing it up after the fact. After continuing to attend the church, I noticed that my heart wanting less and less to do with the body of Christ. I would find any excuse not to attend church on Sunday. I resumed no longer taking communion, and in my heart I knew I was not saved, for there was no God-honoring fruit produced in my life. Luke 6, 43 to 45 reads, <clears throat> For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from what which fills his heart. Scripture directly reflected what was in my heart. Most of my conversations and, re and relations just felt worldly, with no real substance of speech that was honoring to the Lord. Now being in a state that I knew the truth, but I didn't want to pursue it, I was in a condition that could only be described as miserable. At that time, we had a shakeup in our own immediate family in which we left the church we were attending. This had spawned a new season in our journey. We were now introduced into a home church where scripture reading, the teaching would be much more intimate. Again, at this time, I was saying I believed the gospel, but I knew that I had many secret sins that I wasn't ready to give up. In this time, I was constantly reminded of how God would hold me accountable for how I led my family. This struck a chord with me as it gave me a larger view of the impact of my disobedience would not only affect me, but my wife and my children as well. At that time, some seminary friends were visiting our home church. It was in that time that a brother named Lewis would invite me out for some breakfast to share the gospel and mentor me throughout, through what true repentance was. It was at that moment the Lord truly allowed me to see my sins and that I had, that I had committed against him with weight and conviction. We continued at the home church for some time, but decided to leave in search of a church led by biblical eldership. The Lord had placed a new desire in my heart to lead my family in ways that was honoring to him. I got online and searched for a local church with keywords such as John MacArthur Churches Near Me, which led me to a site to search um, churches that were like-minded. We found GBC and immediately attended. From the moment I walked in, I remember Josh Kelso giving me the warmest, genuine welcome, something I hadn't experienced in any other church I'd attended. The Lord, the Lord has now filled, my, filled me with new desires, desires to please him, to fellowship with his people, to crave and desire his, his word. All of these things dead before being born again. The amount of work the Lord has done in my life is astonishing. I'm here again to proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. No longer am I a slave to sin. His perfect death on the cross has paid for my sins and has clothed me in righteousness. I am thankful to be part of the body of Christ. Thank you. 
this way. I'm sorry. <laughs> Based on your testimony, profession of faith in Jesus Christ, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And Matthew Rubensack, come tell us about your Savior. All right, last, right? When it, when it was first uh, told, I was like, oh, that's great. Now it's like, ah. Oh. All right. So uh, my name is Matthew, and... Uh, it is with great joy and gratitude that we gather here today to celebrate my baptism. Today, we are not just witnessing my symbolic act, symbolic act of water baptism, but also me being welcomed as a new member into the family of God. Baptism is a beautiful expression of my faith. It re represents the cleansing of my sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a, it is a public declaration of my faith in Jesus Christ and a commitment to follow him for the rest of my life. As Christians, we are all called to be disciples of Jesus, and baptism is the first step in that journey. Through this act of obedience, I acknowledge that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and that I'm no longer a slave to sin, and said I have been set free by the grace of God. In Romans 6, 4, the Apostle Paul writes, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised uh, from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may also, we too may live new lives. Today, as we witness my baptism, we are reminded of the power of the resurrection and the hope in, that we have in Jesus Christ. Also, uh, or so, let us celebrate my baptism with joy and thanksgiving, knowing that I am making a public declaration of my faith and commitment to follow Jesus. Let us also remember our own baptism and the significance of uh, the act of obedience that it represents. I grew up going to church. It was a big part of my life. Attending Sunday school, going to uh, uh, attending Sunday school, going to, and bringing friends to vacation Bible school. Uh, all of this led to confusion in my life. My parents, uh, my parents' marriage was unequally yoked and falling apart. So I found very sinful ways to deal with the uh, pain and emotions. The sin continued to grow in darkness, and so did that feeling of hopelessness. Even though I grew up going to church, my, my salvation came recently. This isn't the first time that I've been baptized. I was baptized in a Catholic church as an infant, and I have no recollection of that, but seen pictures of it, so I know that it happened. Um, the next time was an open baptism at a very large church that I hadn't been attending uh, very long. And uh, the third time was with my oldest son when he was baptized. The last two times, I believe that uh, that act would change my life and was like my salvation in a way and how wrong it was. Uh, I continued uh, living in and falling deeper into sin and feeling defeated. Uh, then by the grace of God, a friend started sharing the gospel with me. Even though I grew up in the church, it was like I was hearing it for the first time. During the conversation, I was embarrassed, and I struggled to answer questions when it came to the good news. Uh, after having a few conversations with him, I knew I had to, and I wanted to repent. My heart began to change. And today, I'm so thankful for God's mercy and grace in my life um, and the opportunity to share it with my church family. And then I just ask, may I continue to grow in faith and be enlightened to this world? Thank you. Matthew, based on your testimony, profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit.
We're going to pray together for these who have just been baptized. And Omri's going to come up. And if you are here for membership today, we're going to invite you to come up as well. Omri's going to lead us, uh, the new member applicants, as well as all who are members, to read the church covenant together. And then Omri, if you'll close us in prayer and thank God for the food we're about to eat. And uh, if you're in the band and we're planning to sing one more song, you could come back tonight and sing it. Okay. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have given testimony of your grace. We're so thankful for the way that you work to save sinners through your son. You're not done with that work. Thank you that you keep doing it. May we be those who take this message of your grace to a world that so desperately needs your love. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that is uh, incredibly exciting. Thank you guys for uh, all of you who shared your testimony and the specifics of uh, what God has done. I mean, just to hear about faithful parents and God's use of street evangelism, hospitality, uh, good friends, people being rescued from cults like the Roman Catholic religion and just salvation from false professions. Uh, All of those things are truly thrilling. Uh, Before I welcome uh, the list of new members, um, I just want you to to direct your attention briefly to 1 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Timothy. And I'll just explain from 1 Timothy what we're doing in membership. As you already heard so clearly numerous times, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's 1 Timothy 1.15. And what does God do with those sinners whom he has been pleased to save? He does not leave us to ourselves, thank God, uh, but he welcomes us. He adopts us into a family. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, I'm going to read that and just point out a couple things about membership. Paul writes to Timothy, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you soon, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. In just that that one verse, verse 15, we have described for us a definition of the church, the dignity of the church, and the discipline of the church. Just notice the definition of the church. He says, the household of God, which is the church of the living God. What is the church? A way to define the church is God's household or family. That's what the church is. And oftentimes we can just forget that as we come here once a week or three times a week, depending on how often you're here on Sunday. We can forget that this is what we are. We are a household, a family, not because we feel like a family every time we gather, but because because God says we're a family. We are a family. When we gather, we're a family. When we leave here and we scatter during the week, we are still family. And that's why you heard multiple times. I'm asking you, family, to hold me accountable from uh, those who are being baptized. So this is how we want to think of ourselves by that definition, as the household of God. We are God's family by virtue of being adopted as his children. Uh, And also just the dignity of the church. God has dignified the church by, just notice in verse 15, This is the church of the living God, the only body, the only group of people on planet Earth that can lay claim to that dignified title. We belong to the living God. We are his household. No one else is that. And on the church rides God's own testimony, his own reputation of being the God who lives is what that means. The church of the God who lives Also, the pillar and support of the truth. As the church falls, so does the truth. As goes the church, so goes the truth. Not in whether it's true, but in whether or not it gets upheld in the world. No parachurch organization has that 
responsibility. God has not tasked any missions organization or uh, any denomination as such with upholding the truth, but his church has been tasked with being a pillar and support of the truth. So we get to uphold the truth before and in the world. And lastly, just notice before all of this, Paul is writing for this very reason for the discipline of the church or the orderliness of the church. He says, so that one would know, so that you would know how one ought to conduct himself in this family. So God being a good father disciplines, structures his household. And so we have a household code, if you will, to live by. What we're doing in membership, the reason that we formalize membership is so that it's clear to all of us and to the world, we have agreed, committed formally to abide by the household code. Uh, this is God's good law, good word to us. And so we've articulated uh, succinctly what we're committing to in membership. Everybody who's been baptized and saved by God makes a, a good profession of faith and wants to become a member, we are committing formally to the other members of the church. This is what I'm committing to you, to have this disposition, this relationship to you, to hold you accountable, to live in this way. And then vice versa, asking you to do the same, to commit to me, to hold me accountable to these very things. And so I'm going to read a list of people who are eager to enter into a covenant with us in that, in that way. And then I'm going to have all of our current members stand. And I want you to just take, take note of who we're welcoming into this family. So that as you have opportunity today, as we, uh, you know, over carne asada, you can get to know these people. Um, and you can, you can be aware of, of who you're now responsible for and who's responsible for you. So Dwayne and Carla Bacher, if you would come up. And yep, you have those names for you on the screen. James Cheney. Jay Estrada. You can limp up if he's even back yet. All right, he might, he might be coming in later. Is he? Oh, there he is. Excellent. Ryan Fields, Noah Gregory, James Hardina, Shu Hao Ren, and Chang Li, her, Mina Jing. Lindy Jarka and Matt Jarka. Jasmine Robinson. Matthew Rubensack. I don't see Matt yet. This still counts. And Luke Strikesma. Where's Luke? Excellent. All right, these are our, our new members. These are the, the new family members of Grace Bible Church. You can clap. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Matt, just come on up, brother. All right, and, and those who are already members who've, who've been through this process, go ahead and stand. And you can just take a moment because we don't get to do this too often. So just look around the room and go, oh, yeah, they're family. <laughs> okay, we're going to read our, our membership uh, covenant together. Do we have those slides? All right, if, I'm going to try my best to read from this, from the back wall. If I stumble, you just keep reading, okay? All right, the Covenant of Grace Bible Church. Here we are. 
humbly trusting that God has graciously brought us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in dependence upon God's gracious help, solemnly enter into covenant with one another. We will pray for and be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the church, being a peacemaker with all in the church. We will walk together in brotherly love, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, faithfully encouraging, admonishing, and entreating one another as occasion may require, seeking with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows, being slow to take offense and quick to forgive and reconcile with one another. We will strive for the advancement of this church for Christ's sake by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, by remaining faithful to God's word concerning our biblical doctrines, church discipline, the Lord's table, and believer's baptism by exercising the spiritual gifts given to us as members of the body of Christ, by giving cheerfully and sacrificially to support the gospel ministry of the church as it extends both into this community and the nations. We will seek to live boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ where God has placed us living a transformed life and proclaiming the gospel that the mission of Jesus Christ might advance in this world. We will persevere in raising our children under God's watchful care that they might by his grace repent and believe in the gospel of his son Jesus Christ we will, if we move from this church as soon as possible, unite with another local church where we can obediently live under God's word in fellowship and where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the body of Christ. All right. Go ahead and be seated. Um, you new members just hang out. Uh, for a second I'm going to pray for us and then dismiss us and the, the elders will, will come up and greet the new members as well as any other members uh, who, would, who would like to I'm not sure what you're saying I'm sorry check my phone oh thank you Instructions. <laughs> Go get your kids in NGM. Kyle, would you get my kids? In the <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Go through the food line. Tables are in every room to eat at. There is no seating outside. No kids outside. Uh, please watch your kids. Please keep kids off the stage. That's important. And uh, pray for the meal. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do that. <laughs> Let's pray. God, thank you so much for brilliantly orchestrating a plan to save sinners and then unite us into a community of faithful, called out, gathered saints. Uh, what a grace that that is from you. And we just receive that as one of the premier gifts that you have given us under heaven, that we get to have one another. Um, you've also provided from your own abundance good food to enjoy, to be received with thankfulness. And so I pray that uh, over the next uh, several moments, 
that we uh, are here eating together, that it would indeed be a, a testimony to the thanksgiving that is overflowing from our own hearts to you. And we just praise you and worship you for all of these good gifts, uh, the ones that you've given us, the ones you uh, continue to give us and will come in the future. We just thank you for being such a good, gracious, awesome God. And we pray all this in the name of your matchless son, Jesus. Amen. All right. You're dismissed. Go grab your kids and enjoy fellowship. <laughs>